And that first bout was fraught with problems as well, wasn't it? Because you'd had a TV deal lined up, but in the end, that was snatched yeah, away. Yeah, when I went back to, you know, when I got my licence for British Boxing Order Control, I brought, brought two Americans over and they had these, they weren't regulations, they had policies in, in force that you couldn't do live shows, you couldn't have TV unless you'd run so many promotions, and you couldn't have promotions on what they class as major promotions within so many days of each other and all this stuff. And it was pretty prohibitive, and it was also... Um, yeah, it was restraint of trade, and so, uh, you know, again, a very costly experience for me, the first show. I lost a lot of money, but um, I picked up a lot of valuable lessons and sort of got my head down and, and worked my way through it and thought, you know, I'm going to overcome this and, and managed to do so. Wasn't enough to put you off, obviously. No, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, I've said well, I'm a pretty driven person, you know, and if I, you know, I, I always, you know, I suppose in some ways, like a, you know, I like a challenge, that's what I like fighters, you know, it's, all, it's what it's all about. And, uh, and for me, it was a challenge, and, and it was also a lot of fun. It was great fun. You know, I was a, basically I was a kid. You know, I was in my twenties, and it was, uh, and it was an exciting time to be in. And, uh, and that's that. In those days, the sport was run what they called by the cartel. You had the, you know, the four promoters, managers, all lock, you know, working together, keeping. You know, not say keeping people out, but they, you know, you couldn't book the Wembley or the Albert Hall. They they were the only two big venues in in, in London. There was nothing else. There was no sort of, you know, no O2s, no. London arenas, and that was like that around the country. I mean, no, in those days, no city had an arena. We wouldn't be in Liverpool. There was no big arena in Liverpool. There was nothing in Manchester. So it was very tough, very difficult. But, you know, I, I had to be a bit innovative, and uh, I started off at the Bloomsbury Crest Hotel in their ballroom, very small ballroom, and, and cracked it from there. And I can remember promoting in circus tents, uh, Ali Pali. They had a temporary uh, structure there. We put shows on there. Roy, great fight, Roy Gums against Mark Kayla. It was a fantastic fight. Many, many years ago, freezing inside. It was cold and the place had inadequate heating, but it did warm up once the fight came. But all sorts of things like that, and you know, and, and it, it was it, it was it was a great time to be around. I had some really good people working with me. Some still do, and uh, didn't do bad at it. What point did it get to when you thought to yourself, "This is a real goer. I could, I could really make a, a good business out of this." Um, I don't think it was even that, I just enjoyed it and I enjoy what I enjoyed I think at the time more was the fact that there were so many obstacles to get over and so many people were trying and certain sections of the press back then as well I mean it was it was a real it was a closed shop and I, I thought oh, I, I quite enjoyed that aspect of it of actually you know focusing on my shows making sure they, they, they got on you know in those days there was only two broadcasters which was BBC and ITV and ITV didn't show domestic boxing it was only BBC who did their shows Nearly all the shows were recorded. I think in those days they had a um, sports night and grandstand, so they had the shows on the Tuesday night show, the highlights on the Wednesday, and then again on grandstand on the Saturday. And ITV didn't show any um, domestic boxing. And I managed to meet a guy called Bob Burrows who was there and did a deal with him, and it just all snowballed from there. As you say, it's always been difficult though. There's always been people putting obstacles in your way because of that. Do you feel as if you've almost spent as much time in the courtrooms as you have inside? I haven't, I haven't actually spent that much time in courtrooms. I mean, what, you know, what, what, when I was talking about the early days of the press, a lot of the press would just, you know, it's easy to you know, keep putting slurs out and spreading rumours. And for me, that some of that stuff was, 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 was done to actually try and stifle what I was doing. So my only redress was to you know, issue writs for libel. Anyway, I, I think I've only been in court for libel twice. And we went settled. Um, and they would be settled if they weren't, uh, if they weren't, you know, if they weren't wrong. And they, you know, so I, I dealt with them. And I've been a couple of, you know, couple of cases with with guys over the years. But that happens in any walk of life if you're at the top of what you're doing. I mean, you know, I'm sure Sky have been in court with people. I'm sure that, you know, you've had industrial tribunals with people. You get situations with, I mean, Virgin and British Airways had a big case. It happens when you've got rivals. That's the nature of, I suppose, competition. So uh, it happens, and you've got to move on and. Thankfully, I've remained friends, well, I'd say, with 90% of the boxers that I've been involved with over the years, and, uh, and, and, and that's been great. 35 world champions, as you were saying, which is some records. Who are the ones that have really stood out for you? Uh, well, there's so many of them, and uh, it's funny, I was going down the list, and there's a couple, and I think we're dis disrespectful that I actually forgot about, so you do... And, and, and there's a lot of guys who challenge for titles, you didn't win as well, so there's been, you know, like Colin Jones of this world, you know, back in the 80s, and Pat Cowdell's. But, um, for me, obviously, Joe Kalzaki must stand out because of the longevity you know, and the fact that he broke a, a record in, in, in the amount of defences that he had. And some of the nights that I had with him, I mean, when he fought Mikel Kessler, I thought that was one of my favourite times in boxing, favourite nights. 
I thought he'd come of age. I thought he looked brilliant that night. He'd be a really good fighter in front of 54,000 people in, uh, in Cardiff. It was fabulous. Um, Naz, taking Naz out to New York uh, to promote Madison Square Gardens. No Englishman had ever done that before, and I was pleased with that. Not only that, it was a very, very exciting fight. Naz was great to promote in the early days. He absolutely got it. He was a promoter's dream. And unfortunately, his family got involved and it went a little bit sour at the end and I walked away from him. But, um, you know, we're good friends now and so much so he's just signed a, a box and he's managing a box through uh, he brought to me to promote. So I'm looking forward to working on that. Um, Ricky Hatton beating Costa Zoo. Um, Dennis Andrews winning a world title. Lovely, lovely guy, tough as old boots. You know, I'm pleased for him. Frank Bruno. I mean, there's been so many of them, so many of them over the years and it's been such good fun. We have Marco uh, Barrera. Antonio Barrera, I mean, he, he was considered to be not wanted by the, the, the uh, American TV companies. He came with me and we got him back rolling again. And eventually, uh, Bob Aram and I put on uh, his, the fight with Morales, the first fight, which is probably one of the best fights I've ever seen. Presumably, there are a few regrets as well along the way. I mean, there's been a few boxes that have sort of gone away from you and then at some point or other have said, no, I wish I'd stay with Frank. Yeah, it happens, doesn't it? But you know what? It's like your kids at home. You know, kids eventually leave, leave their lead their parents, don't they? They go out and think they can do something or they want to do something on their own. And that's how it is. And I think you know, maybe one of my failings is that some of the guys I do get very close to, and so you feel a little bit hurt by it. And that's that to sound like, to make that sound, you know, that uh, you shouldn't be, but you do. You, get, you work with somebody and some things can, you know, can be a bit of a letdown, but that's life and you have to get on with it. Because you didn't have the bad times, you wouldn't appreciate the good times. One of the bad times, of course, 1989, when uh, Unfortunately, the, the, the shooting. What do you remember of, of, of what happened then, and, and how did it change you as a person after it, that? It, it, I suppose it changed me more towards my family. You know what? And I don't miss being rude. It's the most boring thing. I mean, I, I mean, obviously you get asked that. It bores me to tears. You know, <laughs> I was saying blase a bit. I got shot. I had to discharge myself from hospital because if I hadn't done that, I'd have had no business. In those days, I'd built London Arena. I was the uh, major shareholder there. I'd, I'd a lot of money on the line, and it just you know that, that caused me a lot of difficulties. But Again, I had no choice. I discharged myself from the hospital and got on with my work. Um, I do remember going, I, I, I can't remember referring to those days as the L plan, the lead plan diet, because I went down to nine stone. I lost so much with it. But it was what it was and, uh, and had to get on with it. And you've referred to Ben versus McClellan as, as often the, the best in boxing, but also the worst in it boxing. Was, it well. was every, it had everything, and it had a terrible, tragic outcome for, um, for Gerald McClellan. It was dreadful, and, and it showed a lot of lessons. A lot of, a lot of stuff with hindsight was learned from that. You know, uh, in Gerald McClellan's case, in getting rid of an experienced trainer, which he did with Manny Stewart, bringing on guys who didn't know what they were doing, um, paying them, they were cheap, cheap cornermen for him, a cheap trainer. I mean, got, these guys got paid hardly anything. And sometimes you get what you pay for. And, I, and, and again, I remember watching that fight, and I remember McClellan in between rounds keep blinking. I thought, why is he doing that? And I'm sure if he had a proper, you know, a guy who's been around fighters a long time and knew what he was doing, he may have picked up on it. He just may have said, hang on, Gerald, you're not looking too right here. Because look, he's looking in the, you know, go back to the corner. He's on you, isn't he, the trainer? He's looking in your eyes. Things like that, and, uh, you know, it's a bit, but it, I mean, it, the, the, the brutality of it, the bravery of it, the, you know, the, the atmosphere was just unbelievable. I mean, journalists were standing on their seats watching the fight. I mean, I'm not exaggerating, that's, that's what it was like. But it just turned out so bad. It made me, at that time, you know, you thought, oh, God, you're involved in someone getting, you know, you know getting badly hurt in a fight. And, uh, and, it, and it, you know, and, it's, and you, you actually organised it, you're part of it, and you question whether it's right or wrong, whether you, know, you should be in the sport. And unfortunately, you know, on very, very rare occasions, these things happen. And there were a couple of fatalities that happened quite quickly after that. A couple of you know, really nice young guys like Bradley Stone, and Jim Murray, uh, Mark Gault. I mean, didn't promote the fight, but you know he got hurt. And uh, it was just, just a, a sad time for boxing. But the good thing that come out of it, if anything you can be saying is good come out of it, is that the, the board of control had to review their medical um, aspects of them. I think we brought in a lot of um, uh, neurosurgeons who acted as a panel to give a lot of advice on what should be happening. There's suddenly this new thing came out in boxing, the golden hour. You know, if a boxer gets injured within an hour, he must be gotten to a hospital, there must be a neurological unit within an hour of the, of, of, um, of the venue so he can be treated. And in fact, um, uh, young Sp uh, Spencer Oliver, that saved his life. You know, you think he was in the hospital and had that 
had that, you know, he had that injury and, and, and thankfully recovered. So a lot of good come out of it. But you know, as I say, it was a, it's something all fighters should look, all young fighters should look at it because you know that that is that can be the danger of game. On very very rare occasions, it can happen. You know, boxing statistically is one of, believe it or not, is one of the safer sports, but it is a dangerous sport. Great deal has changed about the sport, as you say, over that time. And now, after 30 years of promotion, you've got the show on in Liverpool. So many title fights going on. It must say a great deal about the health of, of boxing in this country. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, we, you look at the talent. I mean, it's the best crop of talent I've seen for a long, long time. And you look at just what we're putting on Liverpool. And we've still got guys who are not fighting, who can be fighting. You know, we'd like to put on the card. Some good young fighters there. I believe fighters who are going to go places. I believe there's going to be some world champions, hopefully, that I can add to the 35 that I've been involved with on the card. And, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a, a fabulous time for, for British boxing. What we need, we need to get, uh, you know, a, I mean, the crowds are showing out for them, you know, a, a, a turning up for fights. We didn't have these big venues years ago. I mean, we're filling up big venues all the time. And even if you look around the world, you know, Pacquiao doing 50,000 in Texas, in Germany, they're doing 20, 25,000 when the Klitschko's fight. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a great time for it, but you've got a couple of old guys, you know, old journalists who are very cynical and keep knocking the sport, but the fact is it's thriving and it should not be judged on Aldi Harrison showing up or not showing up to fight David Hay. So, so you say, I mean, obviously there have been the cynics around, but obviously after Hay versus um, Harrison, but, but you're, you're convinced there's plenty of life well, look left. look at the same it. night, you know, from Manny Pacquiao fight, from the Marquez fight, you know, for, all, all the way from, uh, from you know, from the States. I mean, that was an unbelievable fight. And then look at Carl Frock a week later. A great fight. You know, and look at our show in September. What a great night that was. Ricky Burns winning. We've had a great... Since September, what we call the start of the season, it's been brilliant. Just one, one bit of a letdown, uh, which was probably the highest profile of all the fights, but where it deserved to be. Well, I don't think it deserved to be, but it was. And, that's how, and that is how some of these same, you know, crit critics... They're, they're the only, sometimes the only fights they'll go to see rather than actually see what goes on. But the fans turn out in their droves to see. You know, we get big crowds. And years ago, you didn't get crowds like this at, in the fight game. We talk about golden eras. You didn't have, you know, 20,000 people showing up at an O2. You didn't have 50-odd thousand showing up at football grounds as regularly as, as happened. You didn't have shows in, you know, in bur big shows in Birmingham at big stadiums. You just didn't have them. Or Belfast and whatever. I mean, Martin Rogan and... And Sam Sexton, 8,000, 10,000 people, two different shows in Belfast watching them. It's just phenomenal to get crowds like that. So it's a very healthy state. The man in the street wants it. And, and you know, and thankfully Sky won it, because without Sky, I think we would be struggling. But they've been great for the game. They're behind it. And uh, long may they continue to do so. Just finally, just wanted to ask you, you mentioned it in the press conference about, uh, obviously, the Derek Shizora and uh, Vladimir Klitschko. The real disappointment for Derek. Where do we go from here on that one? Well, it, it's a terrible disappointment for Derek. I mean, he really worked hard and, you know, he was a big underdog in the fight. And, he, and to get yourself, not just fit, but get yourself men mentally psyched to, to get in with the, you know, the guy who's considered to be the best heavyweight out there was a bit of a feat for him. But it's fallen apart at the moment. And uh, we've, they, they, they've got 30 days to tell us the new rearranged date which has to happen 180 days after yesterday when it got postponed. So uh, hopefully we'll get the news within 30 days and we can all uh, look forward to Derek getting his chance in the new year. Frank, very much indeed Cheers. for your Thank time. You, Thank you. Pleasure.